Uh, my name is Dr. Joseph Murray. I'm a gastroenterologist at the Mayo Clinic here in Rochester, Minnesota. My colleague, Stefan Husby, who's a pediatric gastroenterologist in Denmark, and I recently have written a commentary on the new criteria for diagnosis of celiac disease that will appear in the Mayo Clinic proceedings in June of 2013. Why have we written this? Well, first, celiac disease is now becoming much more common. It's being detected at a much greater rate than it was before. And the diagnosis of celiac disease is really becoming a matter of general medical interest. Because truly, it'll be the primary health care practitioners, the general practitioners, family doctors, pediatricians, who will be detecting and largely managing most patients with celiac disease. Now, with this increased awareness of celiac disease, the increased detection rate, and the increased prevalence of celiac disease also goes some increased complexity of the diagnostic options. Dr. Husby and I both have been involved in developing guidelines, both for defining celiac disease as well as giving guidance on how celiac disease should be detected and confirmed. For example, there are several types of celiac disease. Broadly, there's agreement that celiac disease can be overt, meaning obvious clinical signs associated with the features of celiac disease, be they immunological in blood tests, as well as histological on biopsy. But there's also silent celiac disease. Patients who have the disease, but haven't yet got symptoms. Another group starting to become more um, appreciable in terms of importance is what's termed potential celiac disease. These are people who have a positive blood test for celiac disease, but whose biopsies are negative, and who have a risk of going on to develop celiac disease in the future. So with those broad categories, we have to reframe how we diagnose celiac disease. Many patients don't present with classic malabsorption, as many of us are used to from those who have seen patients in the 70s and 80s. Now we're faced with new paradigms for detecting celiac disease. And how can we resolve differences between the various guidelines? In the past, histology, that is biopsies of the small intestine, were regarded as the sine qua non, or required for the diagnosis of celiac disease. Now, however, with the most recent uh, guidelines from the European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition, just um, published in 2012, serology, particularly serology that is accurate, like tissue transutaminase, IgA antibodies, endomesial antibodies, have been, as long with the genetic tests or HLA typing for genetics, or genetics that put patients at risk of celiac disease, have now been elevated to almost equivalent or equal to histology. In the past, it was always histology first and serology was an adjunct and HLA was barely mentioned. But now, in 2013, both of these ha have important roles in the diagnosis of celiac disease. So for example, the European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition have suggested that in children whose antibodies, that is TTG IgA antibodies, are more than 10 times the upper limit of normal, that those patients, if they have a subsequent blood test showing that their endomesial antibody is also positive and that they carry the appropriate HLA type, and if they have symptoms suggestive of celiac disease respond to a gluten-free diet, that perhaps a biopsy is not needed to confirm the diagnosis. Now, this is a little complicated. This is not a simple, oh, if you have a positive blood test, you have celiac disease. And I think there is some danger that people will not quite take on board all of the requirements, but will rather will think, oh, blood tests are fine, we don't need to do biopsies. And that's not the case. We still need to consider that a single blood test on its own, even if it's positive, is not perfect. Um, and we need to think about what else we need to do. Now, these guidelines published in Europe for children have not yet been endorsed by other organizations. And indeed, other guidelines still require the biopsy as, as a, the definitive 
method of diagnosis of celiac disease. Of course, as we go back and look at the data around biopsies, there are uncertainties. And indeed, biopsies are themselves subject to some uncertainty. There can be variation in the orientation of the samples. There may not be adequate numbers of samples taken for a diagnosis. There may be variation in the interpretation. Even in an apparent clear-cut case of enteropathy, it doesn't always mean that it's celiac disease. And in some populations, for example, there may be a greater risk of tropical sprue. For example, now celiac disease is commonly seen in India, a country where tropical sprue, which can mimic the histologic changes of celiac disease, is also quite common. Now, in developed Western countries, usually biopsies that show damage to the intestine with villus atrophy and increased intraepithelial lymphocytes most often are due to celiac disease. But it's very important to consider serology at the time of diagnosis if it's not already been done. And if the serology is negative, then we really have to give careful consideration to other causes of villus atrophy other than celiac disease. So genetic testing had not been previously mentioned in guidelines for diagnosis of celiac disease. And why are they now mentioned in these European guidelines for children? The power of these tests for the diagnosis of celiac disease is really on the negative side. If somebody you suspect has celiac disease does not have these genes, then they probably can't have celiac disease. And there are very rare exceptions to this. So it's a very powerful way of ruling out celiac disease. But because these genes are so common in the healthy population, finding the genes does not mean that they have celiac disease. And they probably are even of less value in families where we already know people have celiac disease. So if you're a parent and you have celiac disease, you almost certainly carry these genes. Your children will have at least a 60% chance of carrying the at-risk genes. Why one? Because they have half 50% chance of inheriting it from you, their parent but also a chance of inheriting it from their unaffected parent who might also carry these genes but without disease. So what that means is then that child who's at risk, there's only a very small proportion of children who will be told they don't have the genes at risk. Even those kids who carry the genes, many of them are at risk, but most will never get the disease. And there might be some burden to those children to have been labeled as being at genetic risk, as but most will never get the disease. And that is an area of, of um, I think, where careful consideration is necessary, and even consideration of genetic counseling in order to properly interpret the use of those tests in the context of families. Where I use the HLA type most is in patients who perhaps did not have all of the appropriate testing done when the original diagnosis was made. And often months or years later, you cannot depend on the biopsies or the blood tests if the patient's been on a gluten-free diet for that long. And if they don't have the HLA genetic type for celiac disease, I can reassure them that they almost certainly do not have celiac disease. These genetic tests in the past um, have not been much utilized because of their expense. However, as the technology advances, the cost of these tests have dropped significantly. And they've now become relatively competitive with other tests for diagnosis of celiac disease. Probably in 70 to 80 percent of patients, a clear-cut diagnosis can readily be made. The diagnosis of celiac disease has bo both become easier and more complex. We have more options, more alternatives, we have to interpret tests that we are not previously used to. This is a challenge for those particularly in general practice. The development of new guidelines, especially simplified guidelines, will help uh, practitioners understand the new options for the diagnosis of celiac disease. This is a changing field. It is likely over the next two to five years that there will be further significant changes in how we diagnose celiac disease. Thank you. We hope you benefited from this presentation based on the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community.
If you're interested in more information about Mayo Clinic Proceedings, visit our website at www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find additional videos on our YouTube channel, and you can follow us on Twitter. For more information on health care at Mayo Clinic, please visit www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.